very warm welcome to all of you from the Institute of Advanced Study. My name is Veronica Strang, and I'm the executive director of the IS, but in fact the whole team is here this evening. And so it's very lovely to see a full house, and I've seen a number of familiar faces who turn up each year, which is extremely gratifying. The first thing I want to do is to thank our hosts, the ICAW. Michael Itza couldn't join us this evening, but they very kindly lend us this gorgeous building each year, which is enormously helpful to us. And so we're very grateful for their support, as we have been for some years. Now, some of you will know about the IS, and some perhaps less so. The IS is concerned with bringing outstanding international scholars to Durham and linking them into our academic community there, our own researchers. And so my co-directors and I get to foster some very exciting interdisciplinary projects with some of the most interesting scholars around. So it's a great privilege, in fact, to look after the IS. And um, it's also very encouraging to see that, that Hefke and the British Academy have recognized our institute as one of the leading exemplars of, of this kind and, um, and to give us a sort of international leading role. Uh, and we have had a number of people come around the world, from the, around the world who ask us about how we're doing it, to set up similar sorts of things. So this notion of having an exciting interdisciplinary space is spreading um, rapidly. <coughs> but as you will all be very well aware, the higher education climate is not as kind as it could be. And, and so in these very parlous times, alumni support to such endeavors is particularly important. So I do want to remind you, as I generally do, that you're all very welcome to become more involved in the IS. And afterwards, if you want to become more involved, please feel very welcome to do so. Please talk to us and explore ways to do so. Now, as some of you will know very well, the IS has generally had an annual research theme each year. And this generates a, a series of adventurous interdisciplinary experiment. And this year, our theme has been scale, which directly addresses some of the challenges, of course, that attend interdisciplinarity itself, because all our different disciplines often work on extremely different macro to micro scales, and not just um, temporally, spatially, and materially as well. So we find ourselves trying to cross bridges between people who work on the most microscopic things to people who work on the entire universe. So scale is a really interesting thing when, it think, when we think about different disciplines. How do we collaborate with each other on scale? What does it mean when we change scales? And there's some very tricky issues, as you can imagine. So we chose a topic this evening on governance in which scale is a very tangible difference. So we have a whole set of different scale of things happening at an individual level right up to, we were just talking about the UN and the sort of largest possible scales of governance. Um, but we're very well equipped here with a stellar panel of people whose interests very usefully focus on different scales. So we have Professor Dame Sandra Dawson, who is a social scientist and the KPMG Professor of Management Studies at the Judge Business School in Cambridge. <coughs> And she's also been Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Master of Sydney Sussex College. She's worked in the NHS as, and uh, is a Professor of Organisational Behaviour. And she was the Deputy Director of the Management School at Imperial College. I won't go through all her many senior appointments because they, you know, we'll be here for a while. Um, but she also finds time to be a trustee for Oxfam and to work as a director of several major banks and, and is part of the UK-India Roundtable. So to some extent, Sandra is representing our corporate management scale, but also some larger scales as well. And then with a particular interest in the urban scale, we have Professor Christine Kern, uh, second on the left there, and she's a political scientist and holds the, holds the chair for urban infrastructure and governance at the global, cha of global change at the University of Potsdam. And she has had appointments at the Free University in Berlin and visiting professorships in Minnesota and, and in Stockholm. And she's a member of the Environmental Policy Group at Wageningen University, and she's very interested in local and regional uh, sort of uh, climate and energy policy and the sustainable development of cities, the transnational networks of cities. So there's another scale for us to consider. Dr. Ulrika Guru is, is, is taking us from the regional to a global scale, 
to some extent because she's the founder and director of the European Democracy Lab at the European School of Governance in Berlin, but she also writes about European democracy and global Europe. She's taught at a number of universities in Europe and the US and with 20 years of experience at the European Think Tank. Uh, since early 2016, she's been the professor and director of the Department for European Policy. This is super topical stuff here. Never say the IS is not right on the button when it comes to local topicality. And she's also written a book which has got a lovely title, Why Europe Needs to Become a Republic, a Political <laughs> Utopia. I think we might have to revisit that one. Now, as some of you know, our fourth speaker was to have been Giles Fraser, a journalist and a writer and so forth, who's also secretly an anthropologist, like myself. Um, but unfortunately, he had a sort of major health issue and had to drop out. So we have very kindly stepping in at the last moment, uh, Professor Peter Kinderman, um, who has, has expertise concerned with the individual scale of thing. How do we govern ourselves? and so forth. And he's the professor of clinical psychology, so we've got a good science mix here, at the University of Liverpool and vice president of the British Psychological Society. And his research focuses on psychological processes underlying well-being and mental health. And he's published on the role of psychological factors in mental health and well-being. And he's also written a prescription for psychiatry, which presents a, fi a vision of the future of mental health services. Big governance issue right there. So this is our very wonderful panel to whom I'm eternally grateful. And what I'm going to do is take them through a series of loosely framed questions and hope that they will just hurl these around in a way and um, focusing on different scales of governance. But I want to stress the point that there's not really a fixed hierarchy of scales. This is a useful heuristic device, I think, for thinking about scale, individual, family, community, village, etc. But in fact, of course, scales all interpenetrate each other. There are networks between the individual and the state and, and, and networks that cut up and down scales as well. So like anything that is presented in an anthropological way, it's much messier than we would like it to be. But it's quite important, I think, to think about that as a, as a kind of process. Uh, and, and in some ways, giving an anthropological perspective and getting that in first here, I think it might be interesting to think about governance as a thing that humans do. It's a process that we all share at different scales. And to some extent to examine it as a process of creating order at different scales of experience and different collective scales. Um, but I'm sure that our panel members probably have their own definitions. So having got mine in there quickly, may I turn over to our panel? What I'm going to ask each of them to do briefly is just to spend a minute or two telling you about their particular interest in scale. So over to you, Sandra, would you like to start the ball rolling there? Well, well with regard to governance, um, I agree that you can take it at any um, level. And fundamentally, it's about whatever mechanisms, perhaps the rule of law, uh, perhaps um, um, uh, the norms that we develop, by which there is given legitimacy for the rulers to rule for those who make decisions to make decisions with consent. You can, of course, have systems of governance which are based entirely on dictatorship and brute force, um, but they are not, if you like, by consent. If I take that and think about the idea of scale, one of the things I'm particularly interested in is gender inequality. And um, I, because of my background in corporate governance and in the world of work, People tend to um, look at gender inequality in terms of how many women are in top uh, positions, uh, what's the pipeline looking like for, uh, for women uh, with regard to their access to higher jobs. And that indeed is a relevant question to ask governance of organizations. But as I observe it, many of the reasons why we have gender inequality are to do with the, what I call the domestic sphere, the family sphere, where the systems of governance are much more loosely defined and much more based upon the relationships between men and women, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, um, and, um, and siblings, and also intergenerational. And they have a profound impact on the extent to which one might have gender equality. And then at the other end, there are a whole number of policies 
and um, rules and laws which come from the sphere of the state, whether that's with regard to taxation or whatever. So if you just look through the lens of gender inequality and you take the matter of women, for example, on boards, you would find that you've got to look at each of these levels in order to really understand why we have the situation that we have. That's a great start. Christine, do you want to have a go at this? I just want to uh, go on and uh, mention the my starting point, which is the urban level, but it's also related to the other levels, uh, to the global level, for example, because uh, cities work together, so governance is also uh, governance of global networks of cities, for example. So even when you look just at cities, you have all these levels already included from the individual level of a house owner who wants to uh, insulate his house or renovate his house to the global level where cities, mega cities work together. So uh, it's not just this one scale because the scales are from my perspective related to each other, especially uh, when you look at uh, cities, which is my topic, then I'm uh, interested nowadays also in upscaling of local experiments because we have then a, a lot of work already on experiments, on pilots, demonstration projects, things which are going on uh, at a local level and in cities. Uh, but the question for me is always how can we um, initiate such experiments, not just uh, in the pioneering cities, but in all cities? So how does this upscaling really work? And then we have uh, experiments like sister cities working together, bilateral cooperation at a horizontal level, but also the state comes in. Because when you look at this dynamic between pioneers and leaders and laggards, midfielders and laggards, we actually need the state. So we have to bring the state, the nation state, uh, again, or even the global level. Thank you, Peter. So I think one of the, the dilemmas in, in psychology and uh, I think in the psychology of mental health is this sort of balance between um, people as pack animals, as hive animals, as products of the group versus the sort of indi individuality of decision making and, uh, and the functioning of an individual brain. And there's this balance going on in terms of our behavior and our choices, our fashion sense and our, you know, you, you look around here and you'd be able to date us almost identi you know, almost to the, to the day by the fashion choices that we're making. And yet, we're individuals making a choice. Now, way back in my personal history, Margaret Thatcher was, did an interview with Woman's Own magazine where she said, there is no such thing as society. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting because she then followed it up by saying, there are men and women and there are families. And, and that, to be... I think it's dubious I'm even saying this, but to be fair to Margaret Thatcher, there is an element of truth in that, in that people are making decisions. So for me, what you see in my clinical work is that people who are made unemployed are statistically highly likely, to, much higher likelihood than, than the general public to take their own lives or become depressed. Children growing up in poverty are five times more likely to end their lives through taking their own lives and five times more likely to seek help for mental health problems than children that don't grow up in poverty. So there's something fundamental about the social determinants of mental health, and yet we're all making sense of it. And I've spent most of my professional life trying to kind of figure out that equation. And for me, it's about how I am and you are and we all are making decisions. But the framework within which we make decisions, the norms that are set to us, come from society. So we make decisions as individuals, but we base that decision making on the norms that are given to us from our society. And you can see that with, you can see that in terrible things. So you can see that, you see that I think with radicalization of people who commit uh, mass murder crimes. You can see it with scientists who break the rules. There's terrible history, especially in the United States of America, of scientists infecting people or failing to treat diseases, especially in black people. Um, there's, in my own profession, there's uh, psychologists who worked with the CIA to torture people and are almost certainly responsible for deaths, certainly responsible for malpractice. And then, of course, there are people who uh, follow the social norms and decide to put up flammable cladding on tower blocks and decide to avoid tax and various other things that they do. And again, you can see people making individual decisions, but shaped by the culture from which they come. 
And so for me, part of this scaling is about how uh, the individual decisions that are inevitably, by definition, made by the brains of people making loan decisions are nevertheless shaped by the social norms. There's also the flip side, which is uh, about how we step out of it. So there's a psychologist called Philip Zimbardo, who many years ago was studying how we can uh, become uh, abusive to other people. and ran something called the Stanford Prison Experiment, whereby students became quite brutal to one another when they were put, again, in the right social norms. It was set up in such a way that they would act brutally. But Phil has developed an interest in those people who stand outside of those norms and say, you know what, I'm just not going to do it that way. I don't care. I'm just, I know that everybody is telling me this. I know that the group think is, you know, why don't, uh, it's only a drink, why don't I get in my car? And they go, you know what, I'm not going to get in the car. I'm not going to get in the car because you're drunk and I'm just going to stand. So he looks at the people who are sort of hero innovators who stand out against those social norms. And in a way that offers us some of the uh, seeds of what might happen for how we could instill a sense of, in my view, uh, moral and socially appropriate governance, which is to be aware of the social influences and effectively say, bugger it, I'm not going to take the social influences. I'm going to decide what's right for myself and to shake off the social norms and return to an individual uh, authoritative decision-making individual. Hmm. Interesting. I think we'll have to come back to some of those points. Or maybe well, um, first, thanks for having me here. So it's a pleasure always to be in London and... Um, I give you my definition of government straight, but I'm really intrigued by what Peter said, and I truly welcome what you said. Uh, I'm also into republicanism research, which is basically research that, um, I think my mic, I need to adjust it, uh, which is uh, also having precisely the point you mentioned, is that the sort of the responsive, the core responsibility of the society you know, for whatever individual behavior is there, even with respect to crimes, yeah, obviously. Uh, but the last thing, you said about the resistance groups that apparently you're analyzing is really intriguing because uh, if you boil this down to the very essence of what you are saying is we arrive with Hannah Arendt and uh, Eichmann process, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is uh, uh, you don't follow the law if your moral instincts are different. Yeah? And this is the decision that everybody at some point in life has to take. I mean, this is a very sort of shortcut, I admit, but it's, it, if, you, if, you look, if you go back to Hannah Arendt and the Eichmann process, it's precisely this. The, the defense of Eichmann saying, I just followed the law, is completely silly when the law is so evidently <coughs> evil. Yeah? And so if we have diffused power in our systems where we have not that evil laws, but sort of evil laws, not to this extent, then I think we could look at political theory and what Anna, Han, Hannah Arendt gave us. But now, I give you my, sorry for this loop, but we shall react to each other, right? Um, I want to be a little bit cynical because I know that, you know, you want a panel which is uh, also struggling. Um, but I am against governance. And in my last book, I have a sentence which I'm giving you, and the sentence is that governance is ownership for everybody and responsibility for none. And that actually the situation of the European Union, everybody is somehow in, but nobody is responsible if something happens badly and wrong. And that's why the UK finally left, because John, uh, uh, Boris Johnson could arguably argue that he's not in control, because nobody's in control, because somebody happens in the EU, it's not transparent, nobody is in control, nobody has, ever has decided it, because everybody goes out and said, I, did, I wanted something different, whatever, yeah? So you got my point. So if that is the point, then what has happened? If you go, say, through the last 50 years of social science, what has happened is there was Foucault. And Foucault basically deconstructed power, hierarchy, institutions, and so we are all now in diffuse power systems, basically power systems which are apparently also, you are struggling with diffuse power systems, but I'm also, you know, because I'm having, if I look at the EU and the comitology, then I see governance, but I see complete asymmetric governance. I see elites running the system like they want, doing many things which are legal but not legitimately made. Uh, I'm years way back from everything decent that political science has invented, which is that, for instance, there's division of power, that there's taxation without no representation. All, all the things we invented, John Locke kindly invented, Thomas Hobbes kindly invented on how a democracy should function are basically not applied on the EU level. But we call it governance just because if we were to call it government, we would be sucked mm -hmm. into denial that we created something which truly does not work. So now, 
how do we go? I mean, I think it's perhaps for the second round of the panel, how do we go out of this? But I actually think that your brilliant political scientist, Colin Crouch, is, recently, is actually really right when he calls this post-democracy. You could even say that the EU is not only post-democracy, but post-politics. Yeah? And the last sort of thought I give when we are talking about governance, then because there is diffuse power and nobody is in power, and everybody is in denial in addition to not being in power, then the fact is that we are all driven by things and we are not governing. That would be my thesis. We are driven by <laughs> robotics, by the internet, by facts, by events, by, by external threats, by whatever we are driven. But are we governing the things? And I think we are not. And I think we should look at this because that is what creates actually the, uh, the say, this fear in society. Because we are fear-driven now, we are doing silly things in politics, and I think we should revisit our concept of governance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So several things come through very powerfully from, from those four starting points. One is the notion of a sense of order, but where it actually lies is, is a little messier, isn't it? Because we, we've heard a little bit about how the individual can have their own sense of what is, a, what is proper, what is right, um, and also that when we set up larger structures, that the notion of shared collective order can break down somewhat um, to the point where you find small elites fundamentally superseding the notion of representation and, and, and so forth, which, re which raises a very interesting question about is it almost inevitable that when we try to create larger scales of governance that we will tend to shift back to a, a more manageable scale of a network or an elite or, or, or so forth and, and whether that's a, a natural thing. But one of the other questions that popped up as you were talking was, you mentioned animals, human animals, um, was also whether the notion of trying to create collective order is part of our evolutionary inheritance and a, 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 how we belong to social groups. Because I suppose the question to some extent is, we all need to belong to social groups, but we conceptualize them on very different scales. And there are sort of practical necessities at each of those scales in terms of sanctions and so forth. So I want to ask you a little bit about the kinds of things through which you come on. And you touched on one already, which is that you know the internet and imagery and our communications systems, by which to some extent is a public debate about what what looks like order. But we also have the material environment laws that that Sandra mentioned, heritage, tradition, um, all of those things. So I want to ask you a little bit about how we how we kind of construct governance, or what are the things through which we are governance? You mentioned law, communications, other people. What else are we governed by? Okay. So this is not the answer that I believe in, in the sense that it's not the message I want you to take home. But one of the things that you mentioned is about contingencies. And in psychology, right at the most fundamental level, it's not how I think I operate my life, it's not the way that I choose to live my life, but right at the bottom are contingencies. Mm -hmm. Something bad happens, you don't repeat the action, something good happens, you repeat the action. So, from, so that's where we start to build things up. I just think it gets a lot more complicated, a lot more interesting and a lot more genuine as you move above that. And actually I would think that people who still remain at the level of contingencies are probably not fulfilling their, their true potential as human beings and are still acting in a very... Um, functionalist, animalistic sort of way. But for psychologists, it starts off with something called the law of effect. Something, something happens, good thing follows, do it again. Something happens, bad thing happens, doesn't happen again. So I mean, I think interestingly enough, this idea of contingency is certainly you can see in corporate governance because you could say that every additional layer, every new rule, every definition of a role on a board has been a reaction to the last crisis of bad behavior. And so what can we do about that? Well, there has to be a law, there has to be a rule, there has to be a regulation and a specification. And usually that's yesterday's problems and human creativity um, creates a basis under which um, if there isn't a shared moral compass, um, you are always going to have these unanticipated and negative consequences of the systems, which actually then leads us to say, well, at the core of collective action, um, if one is going to govern effectively by consent, and I'll come back to the idea whether all governance is wrong or not, um, then you, there has to be some strongly shared sense of purpose and value. 
Um, and the, without that, there's going to be transactions and there's going to be coercion and there's going to be a sense that one must um, uh, subjugate uh, oneself, perhaps one's values, to a, to a bigger system. But I was shocked by the idea, you can tell, I was shocked by the idea that all governance is wrong. I think I would have a view that quite a lot of governance is wrong, but I can't see, by my limited perspective, I cannot see how one has collective action of diverse um, uh, groups. And that is the case with families, as well as with uh, communities and corporations, unless there is some give and take of acceptance of accountability for delivering um, something. And the question is whether or not we have effective systems for enabling that collective action around um, common shared values. That would be the, the, the best form. Where you don't have common shared values, you're going to have coercion and um, dysfunction and corruption and uh, a whole lot of other things. But would you think, Ulrika, that, that you could not conceptualize a good system of governance? Look, I, I just wanted to be a little bit provocative <laughs> to, you know, no, to I'm make interested. us into this yes. discussion. But actually, I think the governance, and I, I tried to provide a definition. And the, pro the definition is ownership for everybody, responsibility for none. And what it means is, in the classical sense of, say, political theory, like Max Weber's style, what we are missing in governance systems most of the time is the uh, legitimate uh, monopoly the of legi yeah. no legitimate monopoly of power. Yeah. Who has sanction capacity in governance? Yeah, mm -hmm. because if everybody is in, then everybody is sort of responsible, co-responsible, but can. Uh, uh, deprive from the responsibility if things go bad. I mean, take any given EU council. The EU does something, it goes wrong, then every head of state in the national parliament says, I was against, I wasn't, I wanted the opposite, whatever. Yeah? So, and you can find many governance systems in yeah. which the power is as diffused as Foucault basically, you know, mm -hmm. told us that nobody's never responsible, but if things are good, everybody's obviously has my success sort of thing, right? So, and I'm just analyzing. So, in, in, I'm political scientist trained, yeah? I'm missing Max Weber's legitimate monopoly of power in who can sanction and who has constitutive power. And in most governance systems, you don't find either. And with this, I'm not saying that participatory forms of democracy cannot function. I'm not against local um, constituencies. I'm not against participation when people have to vote whether the street cheese should be there or should be there or an airport bigger or whatever. Another, you see my point, yeah? yeah. I, and and this is in science. This is completely research that participatory democracy can function if people know what they are talking about. <laughs> First thing. You would not assume that, for instance, with yeah, Brexit, this is. And if you can, if you can, uh, the German word is Folgeabschätzung. If you can, uh, if you have judgment about the consequences, consequence judgment, yeah? I would argue that, for instance, the Brexit is a clear thing where you had no judgment consequence. I mean, put, people would not know that the FT a year after would say it cost uh, 100 million, billion, billion, million, million uh, milliard in German, billion. You, you see, so if you have no judgment capacity about the consequences, um, uh, and if you have uh, no accountability uh, because you cannot be punished, yeah, mm -hmm. then governance is flawed. Yeah. Yeah? Well, so this is my point, because participation works in narrow defined communities where the people can be held responsible for what they decide, mm -hmm. and they can look about the consequences that their action is triggering. And none of them normally plays into referenda. And I'm, you know, I'm beyond Brexit. You take any given referenda the Swiss have been doing in the past years or so, it's precisely the same, or the Dutch referendum on the uh, Ukraine association agreement and all these things. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's basically ending without any consequences because you cannot implement <laughs> the people's will so many times. Yeah? Yeah. Christina, I can see you want to come yeah. uh, Just... Uh, wondering whether governance is possible from your perspective, because I mean, you talk uh, about the EU level, basically, but I, then you say, okay, at the local level it might work, but I think these different levels or scales, they are connected to each other. 
I mean, you can also say there need to be some kind of devolution. So if it doesn't work at the EU level, we need more participation of citizens or cities or regions at uh, the EU level. I mean, that's a, an ongoing debate forever. So the question is for me, how do these scale work together? That's one important thing. But I also wanted to have uh, an, another point, which is uh, more related to the individual level. I mean, you mentioned fashions, and uh, you mentioned effective governments. And uh, if uh, people just do, or cities do, or nation states do what other nation states do, and it's a fashion, it might not be effective. Mm. So this kind of, uh, I mean, that that relates to the individual level as well as uh, yes. to nation state and, and the UN level, different scales. But what do you do about fashions which might turn out a totally ineffective and, and situation where you cannot uh, solve the problem actually because it's just a fashion and it has not proved that it will lead to success. Uh, so, psychologists always try to avoid making decisions that would lead them to, to be proved right or proved wrong, but always like to comment on what things are going on. Um, what, what, I, what I hear is, is a couple of things that people are talking about which remind me of some of the work by a guy called Kohlberg who talked about, he actually had a scale, he had a, he had a moral reasoning scale, which is a useful word to bring in. Um, and there are two things about that. The, the first is about... Um, I think the idea of moving from consequentialist punishment, reward and punishment mechanisms to abstract uh, mechanisms. Yeah. And that also deals with the idea of whether you're talking about... Um, it, it deals with whether, whether or not people are obeying this law now because it's the law rather than uh, behaving in a morally right way because it's morally right. And they're slightly different questions. So I mean, obviously sexual mores change and things that are legal now used not to be legal in the past and these mm -hmm. things shift and change. It's not quite fashion. A lot of us would see it as, like A.C. Grayling would say, that we're moving away from darkness and towards the light. But things certainly change. And moral, um, Kohlberg's moral reasoning scale is one way of thinking about that, which now it's reasonably controversial in, in psychology, but he suggested that young children and uh, he would say lower down on the scale of reasoning is consequentialist. I, I, I avoid, I, I pay my taxes because otherwise I'll get caught and punished. Mm -hmm. Then you come rule-based, which is I pay my taxes because the law says I've got to pay my taxes. And then it's I, I pay my taxes uh, because everybody else thinks it's a good idea to pay taxes. And at the top of the scale would be to say, I believe in the shared value, which is the point you, you made, the shared value of fairness. And just to bring it around full circle, one of the things is that you can see in children before they have language at fairness. So you just observe their behavior, and it is incontrovertibly true that you cut the apple not into equal halves, and then you give the two halves to the two children, and one of them feels extremely aggrieved by the fact that they've been given the unfair half. So this, this, the only way to, to conclude it is that there is some sort of concept of fairness which is there in, in people from an early age. So you have consequentialist moral reasoning, and then you have uh, values-based moral reasoning. And certainly Kohlberg said that value-based moral reasoning is better. One sentence, the concept of fairness in political science is basically what John Locke called equal liberty, yes. which has been translated with commonwealths, uh, which is uh, commonwealths not in the sense of British Empire, but common wealth, which is shared yeah. wealth. Yeah? And uh, the Latin sort of fundament of this is just res publica, the republic. Yeah? So. That's true, but of course, Commonwealth is also a notion of wholeness. Uh, the, the common wheel is actually rooted in the word whole, and hale, and hearty, and healthy, and these share common etymological roots. And I think this comes back to Sandra's point about legitimacy, um, that, that you need to have some kind of uh, collective consensus about what the rules are in order for the governance, governance to be legitimate. And this, this, is, and this comes down to your point about, I mean, I was a little worried we were heading towards anarchy with no governance there. Um, no, but no, no, actually, no, no. These, these counter movements that challenge governance are actually presenting an alternate vision of what a fair world looks like. So it's an alternate order. The, the difference to governance is not anarchy, it's government. Mm -hmm. uh, where you can outvote people if they're not good, where you can have an opposition 
and where somebody is just accountable in government because something has been voted. So uh, just to pick up what has been said here about participation, no, I disagree. I'm not, uh, you know, my, I'm just, just in favor of the old and ancient writings and thinkers who had a clear concept of what democracy is. John Hobbes, Locke, whoever, Montesquieu, division of power, clear accountability, one person, one vote, and a parliament, which, by the way, has been invented in the UK. I mean, it's England who gave us all these thinkers. So the only thing I'm arguing is we are not we should not think and uh, about this power you know multi-level governance is a lure and it just did not function in the EU so I'm deeply convinced that we need to reshuffle the European system don't get me wrong I'm not defending the EU in the state as it is I'm deeply convinced that we would need to reinvent from scratch European democracy don't get me wrong on this but I'm definitely not convinced that because we have a wrong system the answer is participatory contribution of everybody and I invite you to go to YouTube. There's an artist who did this uh, participation YouTube clip. It only lasts five minutes. <laughs> and he asked five people to do a pottery schale, you know, a drinking pot out of pottery of five people together. And you see like five people on this Töpferscheibe thing and they cannot get a bowl. And the, the task was who does the bowl that every five can drink? And so if you attach this to parliamentarian democracy, it's better to vote a parliament, have a government who does the bowl and everybody can drink. And then we have the question of sharing and the output distribution of that government. But the solution is not that you take five people to make a bowl to drink because they can't make anybody drink. And uh, this, you know, so I think that there is, I mean, I don't go through all these stages of uh, uh, basis democracy versus representative democracy, Rousseau, blah, blah, blah. But um, I, I think the bottom line to be bold on this participation at any level is not it. I, I, I mean, sometimes the, the, yeah, I just, so I don't, don't want to introduce discord, but those sorts of illustrations okay. are interesting because, um, there are some things which, when human beings work together, the output is terrible. But there's obviously something like making a pot. But there's obviously some things which can only rely on human beings working together. So the thing on YouTube is surely not, is it good for people to work together on making pots? The question is, is pottery a good analogy for democracy? And I think pottery is probably <laughs> not a good analogy for democracy. <laughs> It raises some nice well, questions about legitimacy and who gets to, to make the rules. Um, and, and clearly, implicit in what you've been saying is that, that it becomes more and more difficult the more people that you include. And, and, in, and to some extent, a question of whether we have effective forms of representation that ensure democratic involvement rather than trying. We haven't had the best experience of the referenda, perhaps, in this country. Uh, and, and they are unwieldy objects, and yet some countries use them a great deal more than we do. Um, but we have a notion of representation. But we also have, you know, how decisions get made about what the rules are. Is, you mentioned rationality. Um, so is this partly a job of the experts who Michael Gove loves so much? No, but to, to just answer this one. The, the fu most fundamental question of political science since Platon is who decides. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And you don't answer that question with governance. No. No. I, I, th I think the issue of... of so, so being a Democrat, which is, I suppose, one of the shared values, I think the idea of who decides, uh, I mean, one of, one of the sort of day jobs that I have, because I actually do work in the NHS, is encouraging and supporting and helping people with both learning difficulties and mental health problems to cast their vote. Which I, think it's, I think it's not only the law, I think it's actually good for people who have quite a limited ability to understand some of the complexities of modern life to cast their vote. I'm, I'm thoroughgoing red-blooded Democrat. Um, and one of the consequences is, is about the idea of expertise. Did people understand what was happening in Brexit and all of that? My, my, my response to that would be that there are clear failures, but the failure is that, that we as a political class Failed, exactly. failed to communicate the issues Absolutely. well enough before the democracy but happened. We have no dissent at all on this. Yeah. No dissent at all. I mean, the, the, it was a failure of the elites in the UK, but also beyond the UK. I'm not blaming, I'm not here to blame anybody. Or I don't want, <laughs> you know, but it, whatever, yeah, I can blame the Dutch for their referendum. But I, I totally agree. 
the problem is that we too often we take form, I mean form follows function, and we, we, we clinch to a formal sort of uh, understanding of democracy which all too often is first participation and then majority, but these are formal things, yeah? So I'm not against yeah. having uh, dis uh, mentally disabled people uh, casting their vote, I'm completely in uh, agreement with you that it was a failure of elites uh, in the UK uh, and beyond, but uh, I'm against taking uh, because if we agree that the majority of the street is democracy, I as a German, I should say that with the Nazis we had the best democracy we ever had, the best for people's democracy yeah. we ever had, and that the history we do not want to de to say this. Yeah. So democracy is far beyond a majority of the street, and this comes precisely back to what you said uh, when you uh, had your example about the resistance thing. Yes. Because democracy is bound not only to law but to moral. And this is also included in the definition yes. of res publica, because if you go back to Aristotle, to Kant and so, the moral instinct, which is that there's no law which cannot be moral, yes. and the formal uh, following, a formal, a following is not the word, but following formally the law is not enough, and then yeah. we are again with Hannah Arendt. Yeah? I think there's also leadership. So that's my way back to how okay. Hannah Arendt, because the leadership is important. So, Absolutely. So both capital punishment and same-sex marriage, I think, are good examples where people have been led towards a position which I personally approve of. And if you'd gone with straight democracy, you would have, as Absolutely. in first past the post, Absolutely. but Absolutely. neither of those. What yeah. it took in, in the case of, of Capital punishment was uh, members of parliament deciding to vote from their conscience, perhaps as a liberal mm -hmm. elite, mm -hmm. rather than reflecting mm -hmm. the views of the mass majority. And in the case of same-sex marriage, it was about uh, political leaders, again, willing to shape uh, shared moral values rather than be shaped by them. But and I think that, so I think leadership is part of it. Too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's not only leadership, it's education, the sense of Stefan Zweig, which is that sort of the, or Schiller, Friedrich Schiller, the Erziehung zur Republik, the education to the Republic. I mean, this is basically clinging to the values of Aufklärung, of uh, Enlightenment, which is Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, and basically the, the obligation of the educated elites to hold this noblesse of republicanism in the sense of moral, morality in to the public discourse, yeah. So, I, I, but I think all this is really ancient writing from Schiller to Kant, especially, and uh, and and this is why I think you are right that the the fault of what is happening in Europe, far beyond the UK, is a is a dysfunctionality of the elites because they did not, in the sense of Stefan Zweig, they did not function as the Republican educators in the sense of enlightenment, if you want so, yeah? Because you were fooling around with the people, running behind the people, and basically, uh, how can I say this in English, uh, uh, cater to the people's sort of uh, uh, pejorative instincts rather than uh, lifting them up to basically enlightenment, yeah? So, um, sorry for my English. Uh. This suggests a very interesting notion that governance is a skill that requires some expertise and rationality, as you say, enlightenment. Now, I work with indigenous communities in Australia where they have gerontocratic governance. So, it, all the elders govern the community because they are regarded as having the education and the experience that would allow them to do so. So, but, but of course we have an awful lot of negativity about the liberal elite, the educated elite, the experts and so forth these days, uh, which suggests a sort of underpinning that is it's crumbling a little bit in terms of accepting the need for those kinds of skills to achieve governance. And I wonder if it helps to bring it down to a family level or an individual level, in sense, you know, because sometimes family dynamics, how do we decide um, how do families make decisions? How do they decide what is an orderly family life? What constitutes good parenting? Or, you know, how, how do we figure out who's in charge and what their legitimacy is? And, and I'm quite interested in thinking about how that translates up to, upwards into corporate levels, because of course some corporations are actually modeled on the notion of a family. So could we perhaps ask you to talk a little bit about governance at that scale, where where you know, we all have experience of how decisions get made in families and, and the extent to which they're democratic or not. Um, and to some extent, we inhabit very different institutions, some of which are democratic or not. Uh, so I wonder if we could talk a little bit about that. Um, well, I think within the family, um, the there are, there are both 
generalized norms and also norms that have grown up um, by oral tradition and by practice between generations. And undoubtedly, if I look at my own experience, I can see that I'm greatly informed by practices that I have um, admired and practices I haven't admired. And, and a, a chart has um, charted a way with my um, family about the way in which we might be enabled to live together. I come back to the idea of living in a collective, a collective entity with some legitimacy where we're not going to rely on force, we're not going to bolt the doors and hit um, uh, our, our family members who don't agree with us but on the, or with me, um, but at the same time, we're going to try to establish some basis under which we are going to effectively live together and also pass on between generations a sense of moral, um, uh, uh, moral um, value which is going to reflect our positions as, as human beings. Now, but the scale of the family, even if one has um, five generations and lots of children in those five generations, the scale is that I will know everybody, everybody will know me, we will have some sort of shared history and we'll have agreed some rule of rules. And if we don't agree the rules and we find that we want to stand outside them, we'll um, exit. And there may be reasons why... Um, we're kept not because of force, but because we don't have the resources unless we stay along and live an unhappy life. But it's all very direct. I think with regard to, um, to the corporation, I must say my experience, I don't know any corporations that run like families. <laughs> but to say, I mean, maybe this is my limited experience, but I think there can be shared values, but there there is a greater um, understanding of who's contributing what, um, whether it's finances, your labor, um, your expertise. And increasingly in our organizations, people have choices um, about whether they um, keep their skills and labor within that structure. Um, and if they don't uh, perhaps want to stay within that structure, they'll, they'll go off. Um, I think the mistake that's made about corporations is that, that there, it's thought it can be all embodied in the rules, and it can't, and, you, and another rule will be put in place, but you can't have it all embodied in the rules because it will break down and people will gain the rules, unless I come back to this sense of a shared purpose and a shared mission and a shared sense of value. Yeah, but of course this is exactly what corporations do, isn't it? They have their vision statements and those are precisely <laughs> the kinds of rhetoric well, it's awful. Yeah. That's awful. Yeah. But yeah, that's I mean, I would say that's an example of exceptionally poor government and exceptionally poor leadership. That if you if you think that what the values are are the things you have on the wall, and oh yes, you know, integrity, honesty, transparency. Oh yes, but I mean that's fine up there. But actually, the way we behave, it doesn't reflect that. Um, <laughs> then I um, evidence is that uh, people see through that hypocrisy very very quickly, and if given the choice, they'll off out. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it's interesting that, you know, because it's a commercial relationship between the individual and a corporation, it, it creates a very different notion of belonging. And, and you know, we've, we've touched a little bit about the need for collective identity and buying into some kind of consensus about the rules. And that's much more achievable at, at perhaps at a, a family or community level than it is in a commercial kind of, of, of context. Um, but but, you know, there is, this, uh, um, there is this expression, I think, of common decency, right, mm -hmm. which in Germany is Anstand, mm -hmm. yeah? There's a very good book for those who are interested by Jean-Luc Michel, who's a French political thinker, The Politics of uh, the, the Least Evil. And he makes on, because you mentioned transparency and integrity and all these things mm -hmm. which, you know, mission statement, mm -hmm. blah, and bullshit because nobody, yeah? But the thing is, I think this is just a reaction because we lost decency. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, if we had, say, not governance with this diffuse aspect and nobody is to be responsible, but you had clear sort of he's the boss, he has common decency, he reinvests for his employees, he decides if things are not good, he withdraws and he doesn't steal the pocket of the enterprise. Let's say, yeah, which is 
legitimate. I, mean, we, I think we have built a system which is legal but not legitimate. So mm -hmm. there's a big difference between legal and legitimacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So because we have been eroding the principle of form follows function, we do much more form than function. Yeah. But let's think a second back. In that sense, I think we do all this transparency and integrity stuff mm -hmm. because we have lost common decency. And if we had common decency through education and what you were doing, you would not need to shift the system to transparency and all these things which we attach on the wall, but basically which are reaction to dysfunctional systems which we have created. That would mean my reaction to you. So, so the, the, I mean, there, there's a danger that this is slightly white westernized, but I'll go with it just for the moment because it works. So th there's an argument that, that what, what you're talking about is, is functional families that work because they have shared values, shared principles, shared operating rules that have developed by living together over time. And you emerge and you live with them and they work, they reinforce themselves, it, it develops. But it's also a collectivist, almost anarchist, um, opting in by staying in sort of system. Yeah. Because you've also got the problems of what happens if you don't share the yeah. values of other members of your family. Yeah. And typically what works best is to, in a very gentle way, agree that it's time for your daughter to leave mm. and that maybe the lifestyle that she wants is better handled outside of the home. Now this is where it gets a little bit white and a little bit Western and a little bit kind of liberal democracies. Because certainly for me, working with clients, if, if a father, usually father, a parental figure, insisted that their children lived by certain rules that their children did not share, yeah. great difficulties ensued. Yes. And the idea of enforcing rules which are not genuinely okay. shared by all members of the family is very, very difficult. And I say that quite carefully because obviously it's usually traditional views held by the parents that, and the children are usually more liberal. The, the one thing I would say then that follows is that when you have collective values developed jointly over time because people have work them out together by living together and that they're shared, families work well. When they're imposed, they work very, very badly. When they're enforced, they work terribly. Mm -hmm. But of course, I'd be just as worried about a society, uh, a family that enforced rules as I would about the family that had votes occasionally. Any family that voted on what their rules were would strike me as a very dysfunctional family at all. So, but <laughs> both democracy and yeah. I think the other thing that is, is a reflection upon perhaps our is that the extraordinary way now, and I, that it is, uh, uh, I've been enormously influenced by my children, particularly in relation to matters of inequality. Um, uh, inequality particularly in, um, not in gender, which I started off with, but for example in relation to various forms of ability. Um, uh, I, I've really learned to see, I've, I've learned to see the world in different ways as a result of my interaction with my children, even though I thought I was pretty savvy about the world. And I think that that, uh, so the norms aren't just there, it's, the norms aren't just sort of from the old to the young. There is a, there is a, a, a strong way from the young to the old. I, yes. That's a very democratic, democratic family though, isn't it? And, and I think your point about sort of white Western thing is an important one because I think thinking more about cultural diversity and notions of identity, it is clear that, you know, we're living in a society where notions of identity are extremely individuated and therefore, you know, the notion of democratic involvement at, at each level is very different from societies where identities are much more we than I and, and there are definitely environments and cultures and also family cultures in which the collective identity is, is a stronger push for people than their individual notions of themselves. And, and so I wonder how that translates into interactions with corporations, etc. cetera. Um, because I, I, I suppose my question that I'm teasing out here is, has the strong notion of individual identity that has arisen in Western cultures contributed to the kind of thing that you're talking about, Ulrike, which is where everybody wants to participate in governance from an individual perspective, rather than being quite so willing to buy into a collective us when it comes to achieving a consensus about behavior? Do you think individuation is part of the confusion that we now feel? And then on top of that question, I think there's an interesting one about how we communicate I'm curious about the effect of things like social media 
and alternate streams of communication on capacities to maintain sort of orderly governance? My answer is yes. I think we are, since basically the French Revolution, Egalité, Liberté, Fraternité, struggling between the, to get the equation between liberty and equality ready. I mean, everything we did for 200 or 300 years is always trying again to get a balance between equality and liberty because normally these two things are in tension, in normal tension, yeah? And we are, sometimes it shifts to the Soviet side and sometimes it shifts to the whatever, we are all individual side and I think we shifted too much in the individuation side which you were pointing out. But then give, let me give you a third uh, idea as an attempt of an answer. I think what we are experiencing through the internet which you mentioned and this diffusion of power and Trump twittering, whatever, you know, I mean, he, you know, it's like there's no more bank between you and the payment because there's PayPal, yeah, from Gmail to Gmail you send money, you don't need a bank and uh, Trump doesn't need a press spokesperson because he has the Twitter account, so we are deconstructing institutions all over the place, we are losing all the intermediate things in society post-party, post-trade unions, post because everybody has its own NGO, its own project, everybody wants to sell its project. Uh, we are all against taxes because we all want to do foundations and the foundations then do the, anthropo the, the, the funding of things. You see my point, yeah? Mm -hmm. But what is happening, I think, is something which the business community told us and they told us B2B, business to business. Mm -hmm. And so what we do now is P2P, person to person, yeah? And person to person is basically that my son explains to me when I'm still thinking about how to improve the Eurozone and uh, the role of the ECB, yeah. he says, no, I'm Bitcoins, there's no more ECB. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So yeah. my son is completely beyond ECB, yeah. it's an yeah. institution, doesn't yeah. need it, yeah. you know, he's so. And then I think we haven't captured yet, what is that post-institutional world? What is a world without, in, with in a way, diffused hierarchy? Because if you look at these things like blockchain democracy or Bitcoin and all these basically point-to-point -point systems, yeah, the, 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 the novelty in a way is that in every database, every information is served. Yeah? Which means that everybody has power on everybody because the data is no longer the state or Google who has the information, but you have diffused uh, servers and every server holds all information. So it's a very interesting thing what is happening to our society here. Mm -hmm. And I'm just feeling like it's like a, it's a movement like this where the, um, you know, from structured power, hierarchy power institutions, we get to a different power system which we haven't yet explored what it does to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's very interesting to think about crowdfunding of our yeah. infrastructure. It, yeah. I mean, you know, if we think about infrastructure of, of, yeah. of major utilities, mm -hmm. and which we have mm -hmm. looked to through taxation, a, uh, a form of representative um, government, government to uh, provide, and uh, with, with point to point, um, that is fine where the consumption is at the individual level, but when it's at the collective level, when it's at the, so, the social level, whether that's roads or education or whatever, what, how are we going to then secure the governance of, of that and make those decisions? Who decides? I, I have no answer, but I just I, I talked to the German, uh, the Japanese ambassador in Germany a couple of days ago, and he gave me three pages of what the Japanese are dif distributing at the G20 and it's a three three uh, three sheet chart mm -hmm. and it's basically society 5.0 and it was all in circles like food chains security chains uh, uh, whatever chains uh, uh, traffic chains blah 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 mm -hmm. and I looked at this and I I told him where's the we where's yes. the public thing here yeah. it's just about society and how we drive society from P2P you know provision mm -hmm. chains mm -hmm. uh, yes. food yeah. chains whatever and my first instinct as a political scientist I felt like I'm losing my job here mm -hmm. because there's no more public <laughs> don't we have yes. nothing to decide together in what we anciently called community the public the state however you call it but you still do it yeah? I mean you still decide we are okay. still in systems in which we pretend to have functional states and so, but we are living in a reality in which you could argue in many points that this is no longer the case, that the steering capacity of state is eroding, that the, that we, the state can no longer tax. 
period. Yeah? I mean, we have tax erosion in nearly all societies beginning in the US with C standing. And if, if, if it was the thing of a state that the state can tax, then we are losing the state. We are in the momentum of, you know, that this might be the future. And so I'm, you know, I, I don't have answers. I'm just trying to capture uh, this Society 5.0 paper that the Japanese were giving me. And I felt like, where's the public in this? You also, yeah. where's the material world in these very abstract notions of governance? I mean, one of the things that comes out of what you've been saying, I think this is a really interesting question, is the dematerialization of governance, because we haven't really talked about spatial location and the different scales on which people live. Now, we all understand intrinsically the rules of a household and the rules of the village and, and you know, in those kinds of localized, materialized forms of community, because they are embedded in spatial and material things. And we were talking a little bit earlier this evening about Polanyi and the notion of things being disembedded out of material environments and into transnational kinds of levels of thinking. Um, and it seems to me that there's an interesting tension here between the kind of thing that you're talking about where everything is dematerialized because it's all electronic and P2P, but the fact that we all still inhabit material scales. We all still inhabit households and neighborhoods and cities and so forth. And, and, and the tangibility of the scale in which we are governed in, in those contexts is much more graspable. And so it's much easier for people to be involved in local community decision making because it's a physical kind of thing. And there are all sorts of material things through which we're governed by having units called households and villages and cities and so forth. It's when we lose that, it all becomes this kind of amorphous mass. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about the material nature, the spatial nature of, of governance. I would start with the deconstructing property, property rights. I mean, this mm -hmm. is the big momentum we are in, yeah? I mean, so my sons are beyond TV. Uh, they are beyond uh, buying CDs. They basically download everything from Spotify. And you have a crucial sort of who owns what thing here, yeah? And so the moment we are deconstructing ownership regulation in a way, because it's, uh, I mean, again, I don't have answers, but this seems to be a very big problem for modern industries, is who owns what in the internet, who owns which music, the whole thing, the whole copyright basis was based on you have a product, you can be that C with a circle and it's yours and then you can sell it. If that is diffused, it will change our economy in a pretty radical sense and it brings us back to uh, rethinking community in a very different way. Yeah? I mean... Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily... So, so I, I, I'm not necessarily so anxious. I'm not pessimistic. I'm just describing so, a movement. Which I mean, a lot of people have the impression that, that we're living today in a, in a time of immense social change. And even that, I think, how, how, how would you scale it against anything reasonable? So it was one of the examples, we, we had a conference down here last week about Brexit and post-Brexit politics and how it, there is no left and right anymore. And it's, it's, it's almost like Francis Fukuyama at the end of history. It's the end of politics. We have to reinvent politics. And again, it was, we're living in a time of, of enormous social change. And then the car, I was listening to a podcast with, uh, of course, Melvin Bragg, talking about the um, Assyrian um, clay tablet um, library that was found. And it, it was found because yeah. for like a thousand years, the Assyrians had dominated Babylon. And then the Babylonians, the Babylonians over a period of about 25 years, uh, sort of reinvented their identity of as a nation state and then took power of Babylon and then overthrew the Assyrian em Empire in 25 years. Now, for the Assyrians, this must have been bloody rapid social change. <laughs> <laughs> you just think, yeah, and, you know, the invasion of the, the Romans and so on. And you think, I'm not, I'm not, I don't... I don't know how to scale the social change that we're going through now against, for instance, the wars of religion. I mean, it seemed that social change, whether or not you were going to die, go to hell or not, seemed to change rapidly, depending on who you were talking to on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm not convinced, A, that we're living in a period of rapid social change compared to other times. I'm also absolutely not convinced that we should be pessimistic about it. I think there's every reason to be optimistic about it as pessimistic. Just one example, and I know that I should be able to tell the difference between the New Statesman and the Spectator, but I can't, so I've forgotten where it comes from. But there was an article in that that really piqued me, and I wrote a blog about it, about two things about it. The first was that, or what I took from it, is why should we be loyal to nation states? 
And the, the, the author of this article suggested that the nation state is basically the domain of princes who, in order to demonstrate their overwhelming masculinity and possession of, of the means of production through sheer naked power, got people to kill people for him in order to protect the domains of his nation state. So England represents trading uh, marriages set up by basically psychopaths who decided to dominate the, the workers by killing them if they didn't pay them taxes. And why should I, reading the Daily Mail, decide that I'm loyal to a nation state that was set up for those purposes? And the alternative might be trading cities. So the idea of Brussels trading with London, trading with Frankfurt. So the idea of, of the, but out of that emerges, maybe we're, maybe we're living in a world where some of these things, including technological change and some of the social change, means that the hierarchical, state-based, rule-based, um, power-based, authority-based communities aren't necessarily the ones that dominate. Well, and, inst and instead we've got communities that emerge for other reasons, like the, the trading cities. And I guess I'm kind of quite optimistic about that, because I, I figure that we're going to have better communities than the ones that are dictated to me because the current House of Windsor used to, were, were voted in by people who wanted to maintain their dominance at the point of a sword. I totally agree, but I just don't see the difference between what I, I was just trying to describe the momentum we are in. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I would, uh, I'm totally against the nation state, which I de deconstructed to totally as unities which can provide any decent governance in these yes. uh, times. I mean, that's for sure. I see, like you, that the sociology, Saskia Sassen's pounds are it. The future of the global network is from town to town. Yeah, I mean, and there's a back to West Publica. Yeah, yeah, we, and the we, we, yeah. we have a mayor who, who decides our trading and services. Absolutely. So I, I totally agree. And I would also agree that sort of the societal change we are in is by any standards uh, more sort of breathtaking than what people experienced 100 years ago, just to give you that one. But when we invented the uh, locomotive, mm. the uh, uh, a steam engine, yeah. In Germany, the Prussian Reichstag would try to vote a law that women should not use it because uh, uh, more quickly than 30 kilometers, the women would get infertile, yeah. And so, uh, ex post, we know that today we bought airplanes, you know, we're still not infertile, yeah. But also be reminded that the best doctors in 1911 in London uh, thought about the suffragettes that they were uh, hysteric because they wanted voting rights for, for women, yeah. I mean, it was. Your, the, the most is so. Whatever we feel like is uh, absurd or um, um, de the, the deconstruction of the reality as we know it uh, is uh, other people or generations before us did the yeah. same. We also tried to ban the postage stamp because. Um, if people were able to post letters using postage stamps, women would be able to correspond secretly with their lovers. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that, but it's a very good... Uh, so only men would have access to the postage no, the stamps? No, servants the servants would have access to the letters that would be taken by hand, but the women could post the, 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 the letters to their lovers secretly by going for a walk and posting it to their lovers. So, you have, so you're no longer controlling through the servants the access of the women to information. Right. And most of the things we are currently doing is the, is the deconstruction of uh, white men heterosexual, mm. yeah? And, and the, the whole Precisely. global, that's the, the whole, the, that's the point. I mean, getting uh, the, the women into the game and then getting the uh, homosexuals into the game and now getting the brown and colored people into the game yep. is the game we are in, which is, at, at the essence, coming down to the French Revolution, all men are born equal uh, and yes. free in whites, yeah? So, yes. and, and, and there's men, heterosexual, white, which still have a problem to get this, and we are in an continuous process to bring them there in, in a way over the last 200 years of history. But how achievable is that on a sort of massive scale? I mean, you know, despite the fact that we've rejected the notion of territory, people tend to draw back to it. They tend to draw back to a spatial concept of who's who. We talk about negotiating with Brussels. We have in our minds a vision of Brussels as a place with whom we're negotiating as well as a group of people. We have cities formulating a collective identity. Look, we look at Manchester just recently for that notion of territory doesn't really get erased. It simply sort of shifts around. But still in the back of our minds is a notion of emplacedness. And when we loosen this completely to the notion of global citizenship and equality, it does become very difficult. So I want to ask you a question about the feasibility of, of, of global citizenship and global forms of, of governance. I mean, I'm very interested in the UN as a, as a sort of 
way of societies discussing what the consensus should be on things like human rights, ecological rights, um, and, and so forth. You know, it's a forum, but it's a forum at such a grand scale. Now, if you come back to Robin Dunbar's view that we can only sort of handle 150 relationships in total in no. our lives, this looks very difficult no, to achieve. No, Robin, I've written papers with Robin. That, it's okay for you to have that, a go, that, Robin. That is, a, that is what he said, but he said something more important than that. What he said was, we can only handle 150 named individual relationships. And actually, if we were still relying on physical grooming and the remembering of behavioral repertoires and reinforcement patterns, we'd be able to handle far fewer. So guerrilla communities who have less abstract thinking are smaller than human communities. But that's not all he said, because what he said was, if we were reliant on contingencies and if we were reliant on, on physical grooming, we would only be, have a very limited community of, uh, of interest. But we invented abstract thought. So I know what the worldwide community of clinical psychologists is. I know who they are, and I relate to them. And if I go and get my phone from the back there, I can relate to them now using technology instantly mm -hmm. because I have the abstract concept of what it means to be a clinical psychologist. I have what it, the abstract concept of what it means to be a professor. So Robin did say we can only conceive of 150 people in our network, but we have the abstract thought of saying things like, you know, Malala Yousafzai gets sh shot by the Taliban, and within a week, the world community knows about it. And we identify with women, we identify with women struggling for an education, we identify with, with well, negatively, with, with, I hope, with, with uh, religious radicals. So, so it's not, we aren't limited to 150 named individuals who've groomed us. We can aspire to rejecting the nation state and instead being loyal to principles, to shared values. That's what we can do, because we can com comprehend these things. Okay, so but, we need, but we need to revisit at United Nations, because United Nations then is still the representation of nation states. We still have a general assembly. Uh, it's not fair, because we do not want to compare the Fiji Islands with America. Mm -hmm. And if we want that shared value system, and that is the research sort of... Uh, construction field of political science in these days, global cosmopolitanism is basically trying to shift the global representation system from a system representing, representing nation states in the General Assembly to a global parliamentary assembly. I mean, we won't get this tomorrow, we won't get it in a 50 years, we're still working on the European sort of government parliamentary system, but the movement of the global community is, I think, that we need, obviously, what Danny Rodnick, uh, there's this marvelous <coughs> book from Rodnick, uh, The Paradox of Globalization, and he said you can't have all the three, sovereignty, democracy, uh, uh, globalization, one needs to skip. Uh, for the moment, we pretend to have national sovereignty and we want uh, global trade, so we skip democracy. That's what we see. We have that populist but I, thing. But if we skip sovereignty, we have global governance, global democracy for a global uh, economic system. I, That's the way we are heading for. I'll yeah. say one thing and then I'll shut up. But there, there are mechanisms of introducing that idea of, of non-state-based uh, democratic uh, ideas into... So I, I served for a while. I chaired something called the Fundamental Rights Platform which was, uh, it, it fed into the EU's fundamental rights agency. Now, the agency was nation state, so it had 28 or 30. It was Council of Europe, I think, so it's 30 or 32. But it, but it had nation state representatives on its, on its board. But they set up a system whereby they would have a, a representative body of NGOs working at the European level. So, in a sense, they had the state representatives and the NGO representatives. So they're do, sort, of, sort of doing a dimension by dimension approach. So there are ways of bringing it into One democracy. sentence and then I shut up. But uh, the theoretical problem behind is that in order to get rights, we need to be um, uh, citizens, yeah? Because we cannot be global citizens through, without a state, yeah? yeah. So we, and, and that is also if we talk refugee crisis and the whole thing, Refugees have rights through Geneva Convention, which is shelter and food. Citizens have rights like unemployment fees and through the citizen rights, yeah? But the global movement, I think, is a merger between basically uh, uh, um, Geneva Convention and citizens' rights that we, we work on the theoretical construction field, which is how can we get global citizens without being <laughs> citizens of a nation state. And we drop the aggregation that makes us citizens of one nation. I think the, the theory is already working there, and at some point it will materialize into how we do the global governance. I'm far more skeptical, and I think the nation state is not that at all. I mean, it's a very 
lively and uh, you also need it. You need some kind of hierarchy, I would still say, and uh, you need some laws and you need a, a, a legal basis. And I think it's very ideal what you think. When you look at uh, the, the world and which problems uh, we really have to solve, where you don't have a, a global citizenship. I mean, we are far away from that. We also have uh, the, the idea of a global parliament of mayors, like uh, Benjamin Barber. You can discuss that, of course, but does it really work? I mean, I would think uh, you can discuss about uh, the relationship between London and Brussels and things like that, and it's very interesting. And uh, But we talk about mega cities, we talk about big cities, we do not talk about small cities, we do do not talk about rural areas, and I think we need that for everybody. I mean, it's not just about the citizens in London or in the citizens in Berlin. I mean, what about the rest of the country? No, the rest also. I mean, the fact that we don't have it does not mean that we should not strive for it. Yeah? I mean, this is basically the process of politics that we are always striving for the better. And uh, I, I just wanted to say that this is probably the global movement we are in, that at some point, uh, we will need that global representation which is deconstructed of nation states. I would always argue you need a nation state at a certain point. Are they mutually incompatible? Nation because states didn't possible. fall from heaven and we have them since 250 years and if I look at mankind over the last 5,000 years I wouldn't say why nation state has in any sort of uh, uh, biological ontology. Yeah? It does not have. I mean we created them, we will deconstruct them in some time soon and we don't know what comes next, but that there will be something coming next after the nation state, which is only 250 years old, in which even in sort of standards of modern history is just a very new phenomena. Uh, it seems completely logical to me. I mean, we are just in the process of uh, talking endlessly about transnationality, global stru structures of governance, European governance, whatever. And I don't know what will come after, but I mean, you are deconstructing your nation state. The Scots <laughs> wanted to go out. Uh, Bavaria want to leave Germany. Catalonia does a referendum. I, I'm not even sure that Spain in, this, in the way it exists is existing in two years' time. In the Catalonia. Agree, but, so, but this is the nation state as we know it, and it's about to, to go away. In some time we, we also have developed other forms like federalism. I mean, you look at Switzerland and things like that. But that's what I'm saying. And we will develop different forms of whatever, European, global, whatever federalism. But it comes down to the theoretical momentum that if we want to have a global representation of basically one person, one vote on a global scale, we need to de deconstruct the, the aggregation by nation state. And there's no reason for it because I agree totally with, uh, with him. I mean, towns are cooperating, regions, other areas. It's not about big towns or small towns. It's it about is. From my perspective, it is, <laughs> because it's just the big cities. They are global. No. I mean, it's not the smaller cities. The smaller cities cooperate on a national basis. They don't. No, 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 it's not true. They, it I mean, is true. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 You you have, I, 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 I just there, is, network. there is a national identity. Smaller cities have a national identity. Not I, really I think that, that these things operate a little bit in tandem, just before this gets ugly. You know, <laughs> um, you, know you do have uh, some of the territoriality maintaining concepts of community as, as an interaction, and the nation state is one of those. But the nation state, as Ulrika points out, is a very dynamic idea, and it changes over time. And if we look to our historians, we see different constellations of what constitutes a territorial community at different scales. Because if you go back further, of course, you would have the village, the manor, the parish, being much more meaningful, perhaps, than some loose concept of the state. But I think there's several things that happen together here. One is that people will also reconstellate into networks that they can identify with, whether we do this in an abstract sense through survival international or the international environmental NGOs or through um, notions of global citizenship. But it's not necessarily incompatible for us to be both global citizens and yeah, national and, citizens. And, yeah. and local, local and global, and not, and not and national. And local citizens and family citizens. And people, I mean, if we, if we think of citizenship in terms of identity, then our identities, you know, you know, I have an identity, especially sitting here today, so I have an identity as being uh, white and male, which is kind of quite important. There's an identity that has, I thought of mentioning it in terms of, uh, of families, because I come from a family where my parents were deeply religious and I was fundamentally atheist, so that's a sense of identity. And if, and if these identities are, you know, if I, have, if I 
If there was a different system where I would get voting rights on the basis of certain identities, I think I have voting rights by being a graduate of a university and by being a member of a profession and by having a job that I do. So they, those gives me sense of identity. So in terms of what citizenship I hold, I hold British citizenship, but I also have the identity of a man, the identity of a white man, the identity of a heterosexual, and, and that, those, are sense, those are forms of identity that you can hold compatibly with being a, a British citizen. And, and the only difference is that uh, we need to divide between normative unity and cultural diversity because you can be whatever you are, lesbian, Hispanic, uh, old, young, white, brown, you can have the same normative grounding, which is uh, same rights. Yeah, I mean, this is basically the definition of the first sentence of the Declaration of uh, um, the Menschenrechtserklärung of the, you know, Declaration of the French Revolution. All men are born equal and uh, equal in rights. So whatever you are in your cultural affiliation, yeah, uh, does not uh, matter for your um, uh, uh, provision of rights. Now that's my point. And, and, and therefore it can be deconstructed. If we could deconstruct that the rights you are uh, getting are not depending by nation states because we could imagine a system in which we go through a globally designed citizenship, then you can be of whatever identity you are, you still are normatively on the same page. That, that is my point. I know we are not yet there, uh, we will probably need another 3,000 years, but at <laughs> least we should have that in mind, that that's the global movement. Well, but it isn't inevitable. I mean, I think that there is a sort of determinism in the argument. Certainly we can be sure that there will be a reconstruction in, in some form, that there will be change. As you say, the nation state is 250 years, a blink in the eye, a sort of slight blink in the eye. But um, whether we can find any historical, um, on a scale of our world population, which suggests that one will be able to get a stability of some form of arrangement of individuals operating globally without any intermediate institutions that we give some legitimacy to is quite difficult for me to see because of the scale. You know what is the best-selling book in Germany? Is that book of this uh, Harari, who is an Israeli uh, tech uh, writer. And he has a fantasy about what is happening in terms of scientific change. And he says that as much as the cells five million years ago fusioned to become a human body, the big momentum we are about to experience is now that all men, you and you and you, we are all merging into one big uh, homo deus is the title. I don't know whether this has already been translated. We may say that's completely idiotic. Well, I'd say still, it's I still haven't yet got any. I haven't yet got any historic. I've got historical precedent for dictatorship, for um, genocide, for um, uh, various forms of participatory and representative um, <coughs> democracy. Um, I've got. Uh, um, historical reference for slavery, and I've got a historical reference for lots of different configurations of power and authority. I haven't got at scale a historical reference for individual citizenship of millions. I haven't. But it could be. It's not impossible. But I haven't yet. I, I haven't it got that. It might yet. be technology dependent. Yes, well, indeed it might. Mm -hmm. Nobody mm -hmm. has. Uh, it the, might. The world today has many things we didn't it have might. 100 years ago. I mean, ago. and artificial intelligence may enable a, a sort of sense of, of, um, <laughs> of moral purpose. May. May be. Um, I don't know. I'm sure you're going to open it up to questions, I but I thought the one thing we hadn't discussed which you kept asking us was was the role of landscape and and um, and geography, geology, rivers, um, land. And if I just to be very personal, um, what I what I've realised in being confronted with lots of challenges to my Britishness um, because of the what has happened recently in relation to the referendum and in relation to the political. Uh, well, is that one of the things that's enormously important to me is the land from which I come and I see this very much in rural terms mm -hmm. and I wondered if, even though I've lived in cities a large part of my life, mm -hmm. um, I wonder if I had had the experience only of city life 
which is a man-made structure, whether I would have that sort of deep identity with the hills and rivers that I actually see myself as belonging to. Well, I think that notion of material embedding in place is very important. Um, one of the things, I, I do a certain amount of work on water, one of the things that happened when people moved into the cities is they started to wash more because they became more conscious of being surrounded by strangers and, and, and that kind of sense of alienation that comes with being surrounded by others rather than family. People can handle sharing bath water at a family level, but they can't handle the notion of necessarily drinking recycled water from strangers and sort of thing. So there's all sorts of things that happen when people move into the cities that, that, that make them much more anxious about belonging. And it's much easier, I think, for, and when you look at rural communities and their sense of belonging, it's partly because they're engaging continuously with, with that material environment, and, and that is perhaps more complicated. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm neither a social psychologist or, or a historian, but my, my instinct would be to think that uh, even those sorts of ideas are probably uh, quite changeable and flexible and, and generated by us as yeah. thinking animals rather than physically dependent on the environment. And, one, and the, the only reason, that this, is, this is purely based on listening to Melvin Bragg, I have to confess, but the idea, I, we, we today, using roads and bridges, think of water and the channel as a barrier. But 800 years ago, water was more convenient for traveling than land. And so the river system and even the English Channel was a fast means. So we think of our land masses being separated by water, but 800 years ago, people were thinking of, of the water connected. being connected. Yes. So I think we just need to be cautious yes. that what we think is given yes. is it's maybe constructed. I think that it's changing all the time. I mean, it used to have this time kind of thing to between the pull to emplace ourselves in communities that we can handle and in places and the kind of potential. And I'm very interested in what Ulrich said about and what your point about technology, Peter. I was in The Hague recently for a UN thing, and it struck me that we're living for the first time in an era where it's possible to have a simultaneous global conversation not just between nations, but potentially between global citizens. And this is something that's actually only really happened in the last couple of decades. And so the potential for global governance has changed dramatically by the possibilities of actually being able to talk across different uh, communities, whether these are NGO networks, nation states, minority groups, or whatever. Cities. And cities, indeed. Um, so, so I think that this is really very... Very interesting, but there's always going to be a tension, I think, because in our everyday lives, we also need to be in place and have a sense of community that we can feel we're, we're very much part of. And this, to some extent, reflects a tension, perhaps, between the individual and the family, and the individual and the state, and the individual and the city, and so forth. So perhaps this is just a natural tension that we have to, to manage. But I'm going to stop us there, because I'm conscious that there's probably people in the audience dying to ask you questions. And um, so, can, if, if you would like to, I'd like to hand over. And do you want to kick things off? Yeah, I've, I've got a question. Um, I've been looking at the logo that you have up here, and you've assembled a wonderful panel who have done a fabulous job of, of assessing various components of what you've asked them to look at. But what I feel and felt quite strongly all the way through is that you have been describing the ways that we think, and you have not been thinking about transforming the ways that we think. So Peter, I think you said something really interesting, or you hinted at, uh, something that sits inside us as individuals, where there's the we, which is the way that we think about things in the context of a community, and there's the I, which is the personal benefit that I gain either from being inside the we or being outside of that. So what I'd like to ask you, in an environment where we thinking is working in a very historical fashion. I thinking is being brought forward and manipulated. And all of you at the beginning, when you defined governance, talked about consent as being a key part. So what I'd like to ask you to think about is what might be future mechanisms for gathering the consent of the we component of each of us. So the bit of us that thinks about community and what's best for <coughs> us as a group of people rather than me being manipulated by facts that are not necessarily strictly true, my consent is being manipulated because I am pandering to the I, the if. Okay, so I think that, yes, and I, I've got a note here which I 
haven't used, but now's a good time to use it. So I think it's a bit about this idea of, you know, how, how do we become the person who isn't the torturer? How do we become the person who says, actually, I'm not going to do that? How do we become the person who doesn't go along with the flow? And I think one of the ways of reintroducing the sense of, well, for me personally, and this is slightly more personal than it's the, the evidence of science, I suppose, is I think some, some of it is about making sure that we have the, the mental space in order to say, I'm going to understand what the influences have been on me, and I'm going to reacquaint myself with my basic moral principles, and then I'm going to act according to the moral principles and not what the law tells me to do. Um, I did this with my son, which I, I found a, a, just a wonderful experience, because you go, we're sitting there, we're waiting, we're waiting for another member of the family, and he goes, Dad, you'll be really proud of me. All right, good. And he goes, uh, me and Will, basically to cut it slightly short, me and Will helped the police because we told them where the gypsies were staying. Right. Good. What do you think the police are going to do with them? And he goes, well, I hope they're going to move them on because they're, sta they're staying on, uh, on Will's dad's farm. Went, right, where are they going to move to? And he goes, I don't know. I will think. Where... And so it led on to where the traveller communities stay in their lifestyles. And then, he, then he, and it led on directly to Hitler and the question of, is obeying the law always good? And he, at the end of it, he went, shit, he goes, That's maybe. And I just thought, that, you know, what I'm doing there as a father is saying, don't accept what's given to you. Understand where the, things that you're, the rules that you're operating to come from. Stand away from the social norms that are given to you and, and actively use your individual brain power to analyse the influences on you and, if necessary, step aside from them and return to some core moral principles rather than just go along with the groupthink mentality. So I think the way out of this for us is to help people um, resist groupthink, resist the pressure of do what's always been done because it's kind of it's like whatever's been done. Resist, obey the law because obeying the law is right and instead return to what I think is another theme that comes from here which is shared moral principles and if necessary stand up for your principles. That's why I would be prouder to stand up for the UN Declaration of Human Rights than to stand up for the Britain. Exactly, and the quote from Hannah Arendt is, nobody has the right to obey. Nobody has the right to obey because you are too always bound to your moral, which is only in you. And the second sentence of Hannah Arendt is that the difference between Old and New Testament in a group dynamic process is always bound to your own moral decision. Yeah. And this is why the heroes we have are those who resisted. Uh, we that Sophie Scholl or Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the German case, you know, and uh, how can we get people there? Education, education, education. And there's a paradox here, which is how do we teach my son to think of the collective good? Yeah. Teach him to be an individual. Yeah. And so we have so many inbuilt processes in modern society that everything is ego, 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 my earning, my, I mean, I'm also teaching students, yeah, and then, and, and, uh, it's a mess how we handle education these days, yeah, because we have trained them that they need to be the best. Uh, uh, we, we fool around with uh, notation. Everybody needs to have a, a best notation. If not, they don't get jobs. You, you see, I mean, we have really inbuilt processes these days, which are all analyzed. I mean, modern sociology has done a famous job to analyze all these inbuilt, petrifying processes that we have in petrifying structures that everybody is on an eye trip these days. And uh, the worst of all is that younger uh, age cohorts do not even know that times have been different um, some time ago, yeah? And uh, because they are lacking now uh, modes of comparison, yeah? They feel like this is the norm now. And this is, uh, I'm always thinking that systems who don't function break at some point and then history will revisit this, yeah? But for the moment, uh, we are in, in, an, in, an, in, in a trip where we, we forgot the we in the sense of Richard Sennett, yeah, the tyranny of the I and the fall of public man. And, um, and I agree, uh, it's uh, education, 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 but for education you need to spend money on education and then I could go on and say we have inbuilt systemic mechanisms that we do not invest in education because we do not want critical people. Critical people is the worst to have. Uh, I mean, who wants critical people who think? Uh, we want people who behave, we want people who are efficient. I mean, just think a second about why do people need to be efficient? I mean, are we here on earth to be efficient? I mean, you could deconstruct that in a nutshell. Yeah? But we are still in, an, in, a, in, an, in a global, Foucault would say, uh, knowledge order that people need to behave and to be efficient. Why? But the, this notion of morality as some kind of abstract doesn't work for me because it, this is something that is composed by human brains. Mm -hmm. and, and to some extent, I suppose what I want to ask you, is morality 
a sort of global meta discourse um, in which we agree fundamental things like human rights and so forth. And climate protection and, 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 and those things, yes. So, so, you know, it doesn't come from nowhere. I went to a lecture by George Ellis just recently in Oxford and he was trying to compose the notion of morality as some kind of independent thing, but I think what he really meant was God. Um, and, and being an atheist, I, I found that rather difficult to think. But, but, you know, this is something that comes out of a kind of meta-discourse between human groups, uh, surely. Yes, our, our scientific understanding of the cosmos is, I would argue, not perfect and liable to change through further experimentation and therefore a structured form of, uh, of observation and discussion. But it represents the current best model that we have for the universe. And therefore, it's good for me. And I think the UN Declaration of Human Rights represents pretty much the current best model of the framework of rules, not rules, the framework of principles to which we should aspire. And it can be changed. Maybe in, in 50 years' time, when we have a different representative system, we'll, we'll have version two of it, and it'll be even better. Well, that's all right. That's okay. This brings us very neatly full circle back to consensus. But there are other <laughs> questions. Can you shout? This is striking me as of its time. And you, are, you can't help being anything but of your time. And what is it that moves people to the next bit and moves people on in thinking? I mean, do you as thought leaders kind of encourage everyone to think a certain way and then move and think another way? Or is it just technological innovation? Like I went on a Stone Age tour where the bright guys were the ones who told them to be off the post in the ground. And that they thought, I'm a historian, they thought totally differently. So who changes that? Is it, I think it's economics and, and um, technological innovation, particularly you know, that brings that on. But is there a role for people such as yourselves as thought leaders to kind of encourage change and come out of that te technology and think a different way? Well, I think there are sometimes uh, moments in uh, sort of global mankind when we change thinking, for instance, when uh, we stop thinking that the Earth is the middle of life, yeah? And there was, uh, who was it, Copernicus telling us that uh, we are actually just a bit of the universe and we are turning around the, the sun. So, and it took the Catholic Church, I don't know what, how many, 200 years to accept that Galileo, Galileo statement. Uh, and I think new things will come. Yeah, I mean, Galileo, I mean, there was this three, how would you call demutigung and humiliation of uh, mankind. Yeah, the one was we are not uh, the center of the universe. Yeah, that was Galileo. The other is uh, Darwin. We are evolution and not invented by intelligent design. Uh, the third was Freud. We are running by an S. Yeah. And these were the three big deconstruction of, uh, of humiliations of, say, uh, mankind, ego. Yeah? I guess other will come. We just do not know them yet. Other questions? I mean, I think curiosity, curiosity and creativity um, are, by definition, uncontrolled. Mm -hmm. And jolly good show that is. And I think, I don't know that we're thought leaders, but most of us are in some ways educators. And I think that the, uh, the commitment to open discussion and to um, willingly accept different paradigms of seeing the world, which has not always been a characteristic of educators, um, either historically or contemporarily, um, is, is something that we really have a, a very, very strong duty I mean, to I, do. Yeah. I, I think the answer to, to your question is yes, all of that. So sometimes technology happens to us, like the internet, and we respond by, by adjusting our modes of action and modes of thought even to adjust to the new technology. Sometimes we commission new technology, whether it's genetic manipulation actively in order to shorten the um, length of wheat stalks so that they, they don't fall over and they don't waste energy growing the stalk and you use more energy to grow the wheat stalk. We did that actively, deliberately in order to do it, or breeding animals, an active, deliberate, or Croesus decided to, to work out a way of testing gold so that it's not, not ripped off. This is where, where curiosity drives innovation. Sometimes the innovation drives us. And sometimes it's people wanting to organize things differently and deciding that 
you know, Julius Caesar deciding that he's going to cross the Rubicon because he wants a different system, whether that's for selfishness or in order to improve the, the lot of fellow human beings. So I think the answer is all of that. And I think we're, we're, we're little meerkats, really, us. We're, we're little monkeys. We, we notice things, we experiment with things, we save some of the seed and see what happens if we chuck it on the floor. And then, it, then it works out well for us and we have more babies and life <coughs> continues. And it's, it's that curious mix of curiosity and experimentation and observation and then, as, I, as Robin Dunbar would emphasize, we also remember to put it into words and explain to our daughter how it works so she can explain to her daughters in turn. And that's probably the most yeah. important bit. And, and, and also, albeit that uh, we've talked a little bit about artificial intelligence, but let's not forget that technology doesn't... Um, we, we don't yet have a world in which technology um, sort of spontaneously combusts into life. It is um, human creation. But it's also a mixture, I would think. It's not just an individual, I, I think it's also institutions. And I think we don't talk too much about institutions here, but they are really important. And if you have this kind of entrepreneurs or key figures or whatever if you want to call them, innovators, they also need some kind of an institution, create institutions where you have uh, something which really uh, has a maintenance and uh, where you yes. can go on later on. The story of horology and longitude is part of that. You need an institution in order to allow the development of the technologies that solve a problem, practical problem for navigation. I think this gentleman here is nice. Well, may I suggest you answer the comments you just made that we are universally regressive in our thinking, <coughs> uh, motivated very largely by religion. Um, the technology is fine, but there's a great movement, as we know, in the world, which is, in my view, regressive. And that's something we haven't addressed. I think the notion is, uh, the, uh, in Germany, we talk about the um, 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 the regressive modernity and regressive modernity is to capture that things are both they are going ever better but they are also going worse to give you an example if you read global statistics we can say that we have less people dying from hunger than 10 years ago we are improving water security blah 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 so it's in statistics globally it's going up yeah but obviously that modernity affects many people and they are going regressive, which is a feature for all this populist vote we have in, in Europe, you know, so going back in modernity. Um, and the thing is we have both at the same time and this is the momentum we are in. And, and in both in terms of any one of us in this, in this audience, the chances of us personally suffering mm -hmm. as a result of, of the, the current disputes about religion are, are, are much lower than the, the chance of us being hit by a road vehicle on, on the way home. And in terms of the chances of my son being called up to fight in armed conflict, again, even given some of the wars of conflict that have happened over the past few years, the idea that that's largely been driven by religion compared to the European wars of religion in the, in the Middle Ages, no, I'm, I'm not sure I buy, buy the notion that we're currently in a crisis driven by religion maybe a small kickback to the fact that we're, in my opinion, becoming a much more secular world. That's what I would say. We are not driven by religion, but we are uh, in a crisis of orthodoxy. Yeah? Orthodoxy is, I think, the problem. And orthodoxy in uh, the sociology tells us that, uh, I mean, if you mean, for instance, terror, religion, terror, ISIS, uh, ISIS. Uh, I'm of creationists. Of, oh, the creationists, okay. Um, I mean, well, then, who, who knows what Donald Trump believes? Huh? <laughs> but then you, you, you could either say that the Catholic Church was the invention of fake news, yeah, because uh, uh, birth without uh, creation, uh, sex, or, I mean, you, you can say this, yeah, with, and, and then we can have a huge discussion about what is reality, what is, a, you know, what is real and what is not real, yeah. And you, you could easily say that for what is real for us, say the West, Europe or so, is all constructions. Uh, you, you know, I mean, you can say Trump is doing fake news today, yeah? But you could also say that there were fake news about the Iraq war, yeah? 
But by then we believed that, and it was Tony Blair who was a true believer of the fake news by then in 2003, and we built a whole thing, which is the UK intervention into Iraq on that fake news, which today we deconstructed as fake news, because the Blix report and all this was fake news, but we were inclined to believe it, because by then the US still had a power structure enough, right? Mm -hmm. Today, we do not want to believe in the news that Trump, uh, you see my point, yeah? We are, we are going into huge discussions about what are belief systems, religious or non-religious belief systems. Yeah. I mean, there, there is something that follows, incidentally, just picking up on the idea of creationists and religion and so forth, which I think you can learn from some of the things happening in the UK, which is the benefit of all of our children being educated together. And the idea that we should move towards a system whereby we educate our children separately is something that quite frightens me. I think for, for our collective benefit, we need to educate our children together because that's how you get the, not only shared values, but also a shared sense of what the universe is and how it works, I think. And what is reality, yeah. I think we've only got time for just a couple more quick questions and brief answers, but the gentleman in the pink shirt there, perhaps, and then we've got other one just... Here, oh, and I'm missing one over there too. Maybe three very quick ones. I'd like then... to quickly suggest that a, uh, another component of um, mechanisms of governance is basically as a method for um, building trust. And uh, to speak to what we were saying about technological in innovation uh, and to touch upon um, blockchain technology, most mechanisms of governance as we have now are about building trust, but to, um, to, uh, to quickly um, cite someone who's active in the, uh, in the sort of digital currency space, um, the internet intends to um, trivialize distance. The blockchain intends to trivialize trust. What do you think are the implications for governance of a system of moving away from, uh, moving away from a system where we have governance to build trust and rather having a system of governance where trust is not needed in the first place. Wow. Whatever the answer is, and I think we don't know it yet, but trust relates to belief. Yeah? It does not relate to knowledge, just because you trust. Yeah? And it relates to your question. Yeah? We had systems in which, for whatever reasons, we trusted our governments and that were belief systems which we liked and which were fine for a certain period in time. We, I say this without any judgment. It just worked because we had trust. Yeah? And what is happening today is that, for whatever reason, the trust is gone for many reasons, because of that financial crisis where we fooled around with the money of the citizens. We know some of these reasons, but the trust is gone. And the moment the trust is gone, we have the erosion of the political systems we have, and that's what we are discussing, governance, so. But my point is, whatever will be the next thing, bitcoins, blockchain, blah, and the trust relationship to, to, to what we build, is we need to, I think, understand that whatever comes is because we agree to believe that that what comes is good. And whether that what we will believe in is actually a fact or not, is just a very different discussion. This, the essence will be that we agree on new, you know, Hannah Arendt always talked about uh, prejudices, yeah? And prejudice is a very negatively connotated <coughs> term. We have, you have a prejudice on this. Other. Hannah Arendt says that prejudice is a very valuable thing for society because you have prejudgments of ancient generations of what you should believe in because nobody is capable to always judge on everything. So prejudices make a society run. And I think the crisis of today, which we all experience, is that we are losing all our prejudices of the world which was sort of, or many of the prejudices we had in the past. State is good, the USSR is bad, the US is good. I mean, everything we had in sort of intuitively here. And all this is eroding. And it leads to something new, and the collective search is on which prejudices are we going to agree in the next whatever thing so that we have trust to new things. I mean, trust is fundamentally based on a sense of altruism. When, before the days of Satnav, I was lost, I would wind down my window of my car, I'd see a stranger, and I would have a belief that she was benignly intended to me. And that if I said, can you tell me the way to the station, that she wouldn't say, yes, she could, because, and when she couldn't, and she wouldn't say, go left, when she knew I'd got right. That she had an altruism, and, a, and, a, uh, and that she was benignly intended towards me. 
And that seems to me the fundamental trust. So as soon as you don't believe in benign intentions of the other, then trust goes. If trust goes, one thing we know is there'll be more and more and more calls for rules, because <laughs> rules is going to be what... We, we're not going to rely on altruism, which has a sense of the collective. We're going to rely on rules controlling um, individuals. And we know, historically enough, that if you rely just on rules, people will gain them, they will escape them, they will do all sorts of things. So I don't know the answer to your question, but I do know that um, I could predict if trust is completely eroded, uh, we will have more and more but ineffective rules. Uh, and and surveillance of the rules, and yeah. that mm -hmm. is what we are doing, surveillance yeah. of yeah. the rules. So, yeah. so, I, mean, I think we live in a, a, a grey world, and we always have done. So at one extreme, there are rules of various kinds that put sanctions on, on people. And they put, they put sanctions on people because there are people who will abuse trust. You know, if it is the case that, that yeah. you know, we, we, invent, we invent priests, and then, the, then some of those priests use the cover of their cassock in order to abuse our sons, and that's an abuse of trust. Those things happen, and we have laws and rules, and we have investigations, and things happen. At the other extreme, of course, we, we, we don't either trust people or distrust people completely. We just get on with it. The statistic is that about one in ten of us, I'm only making eye contact with you for very deliberate reasons, about one in ten of us in this audience is currently uh, having some sort of extramarital affair. Is the statistic. And we kind of know that what? is an extramarital affair. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not married. <laughs> and what we do is we, we realize that these things happen. You know, we, very, very few of us are currently living with the person that we first fell in love with. These, our relationships are messy and difficult. We kind of know that. In, in the gray area in the middle, People are not to be trusted completely, but are not to be distrusted completely. And we kind of work it out on the basis of, again, on a combination of what has their past behavior been like? What are the rules? How much can I gain information about it? What do they say? To what extent do their statements accord to their beliefs? Can I be reasonably confident within the bounds of probability, A, that I can trust them, and B, that I'm not going to be hurt too much? But I just won't give them all of my money. I'll leave a little bit in the bank account. Or all of my love. <laughs> no, we give them all of their love. Moving right along here, um, I think we really are running out of time, but... Um, one, maybe one last question, and then, and then perhaps we'll, we'll have drinks and you can continue to ask questions, but in a more informal forum. Well, Just one this more. This is probably a, uh, a question or comment for, for the start of another debate, but um, it does strike me very much, listening to you, very much how this is a Western intellectual debate. Yeah. It, it starts from the principle of having individual responsibilities and we build them up to the collective. If you are having this debate in somewhere in Asia, mm. India, China, mm. Indonesia, and so on, you would have a completely mm -hmm. reverse. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. would be people would yes. be saying, did the collective mm -hmm. uh, uh, benefit of the society is much more important than the individual. And, and, so, and, yes. and you know, how would you get there to global government mm -hmm. or this? Mm -hmm. I just don't my, see it. One of my colleagues. I see it coming suddenly. Yeah. And when they, people say, oh, well, everybody subscribe to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah, they wrote on a piece of paper. They don't believe it. It is a collective, which is much more important. It supports the whole of society. Yes. We've got into a situation where the, everything is divided up into little individuals. We're trying to reconstruct something again. So the deconstruction, which we were talking about, uh, requires a new construction, mm -hmm. which I don't think I've been uh, convinced that's you're completely right. My father, who is, who is now dead, he, uh, I mean, I, I never got on with him at all. I, I, I flew to Hong Kong in order to get married because it was the furthest part on the planet that I could get married to be apart from my father because he, he was a strict Baptist minister and he was an extremely religious man. He would have had no truck with anything that anybody has said, literally nobody in this room has said, because for him, it all came from the God and it was dictated to the prophets, including Jesus Christ, by God, and that was the rule. And governance was, do what God tells you, or you will go to hell. That was just the rule. And it's not my rule, but yes, that exists a lot in the world. Okay. But also the emphasis upon the collective as a natural way of looking at the world to begin with is certainly uh, culturally various. And um, I'm afraid we're, we're pretty homogeneous up here, not in our views, but in our background. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I, I, I know that there are one or two people who still hope you can have questions, but may I suggest that you bring them and buttonhole our speakers over a drink because I expect everyone's getting a bit thirsty by this time. I'm conscious that we've worked our panel extremely hard. This is a very a tricky topic, um, but I would like you to uh, join me in thanking them very warmly for all their wonderful <laughs>